Thank you. My name is Margaret Edwards. Um, uh, while they're shifting into position for the Q&A, the very quick Q&A, um, I just want to kind of give a few um, ground rules for the Q&A. Uh, this is a conversation that we want to have with the artists, and so we uh, ask that you restrict your uh, contributions to the conversation to questions, right? Observations are lovely. We love them. However, to keep the conversation going, to be inclusive of everyone, really let's um, reframe your observation into a question if you can. Uh, and we'll get started just as soon as uh, we have a moment for everyone to uh, have a seat. Um, I'm going to start us off um, and ask. Hi. That's right. Hi. Hi. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask them, and while we're sitting down, they can think about this. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, since this, since Prelude is about works in process, and this particular block is about works in process, um, what is the what uh, were you looking to discover or understand or rethink or uh, in this act of presenting the work to the public at this stage of the work? And anyone can start. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, so, um, it's not even on. Here, you can have this one. Sorry, I think I just flipped it on and on. Um, hello, 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 hello. Yay. Okay. Um, I think one thing that we were um, looking to gain from this experience of the Prelude Festival was really the opportunity to kind of put together some pieces of things that we had been thinking about um, in, as it regards to the jazz singer. Um, and so this was just a, a little small slice of um, kind of where our ideas started. And so we were interested to know um, what people kind of gathered from all of these pieces that we were kind of putting together to say something and uh, just wondering of what you thought was being said. <laughs> I guess that's a good place to start for us at least. So last spring this performance was perform a much longer version of what you saw today was performed by Lydia and myself um, at Brooklyn Arts Exchange <laughs> at the end of my um, second year artist in residency there. Um, and we've decided since that it will become a solo for a presentation in April, but in order for it to do so, I need to try some things where either I pretend Lydia will be a big part of the creating of this work, um, like a, like a, a an extra set of eyes that who will um, spiritually be in the work and present in the room each time it's performed, but not performing it itself. And Lydia will be at all of the rehearsals, so she will be my accountability buddy. Um, and I think that what I was really trying to do for this iteration was let's just ask a group of strangers to imagine someone th whom I know very well. And how can I convince them that she was supposed to be here, but she went missing? <laughs> um, or maybe not. How can I play with that? Um, and I think that this was my first or second stab at something like that with this process. We'll experiment. Thank you for experimenting with me. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good thank you for experimenting with me. <laughs> um, I think there are a few shifts in the piece that uh, I can't understand until I do it with other people in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, like what does it mean to kind of like have a dance party and make people listen in that way and then like gradually over time, of course, um, change and force them to kind of acknowledge 
the social contract that they have signed as audience members and and thusly cognizantly listen in a different way. Um, so I think a few of the things, if that makes sense. So I think a few of the things that I needed to understand was one, like I needed to see people dancing and experience them like what just happened. <laughs> and um, I needed to do the, the auto, like the speech to text situation. I needed to do that in a space that wasn't my bedroom, you know, in a space that I couldn't control and understand um, the things that I need to consider in order for that to like actually work in a performance. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have any questions from our yeah. audience? Might have for any of the uh, artists on stage? Yes. Um, I've been, there's a wonderful text by Sophia Noble called The Algorithms of Oppression. Um, Google it. It's really good. I, I would say that in jest. Um, but I, I've been, I've been, you know, thinking through what she's considering, which is like for a very long time, if you were to posit any like minority group girl, right, Google would give you a very specific output. Right. And so what does it mean to work with these algorithms that are veiled that we don't have access to? And I thought it would be interesting to put a sonic experience through that process so that groups of people could watch something generate that doesn't represent their experience as a way of maybe speaking to other things. Any other? One and two, and then I think that might actually be all we have time for, depending on how deep they are. We'll see. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, ownership is a word that, that does pop up. I mean, I think in particular, uh, we talk about who owns the concept of jazz in the first place. Uh, and, and ownership of story is, of course, something that comes up with this piece a lot. Uh, in fact, I think one of, the, one of the reasons I was particularly a, attracted to the jazz singer as a sort of cultural object uh, is, is in that it's a, a piece that by all accounts belongs to me as a Jewish American, you know, uh, who is struggling with what it means to be like more secular than Jewish. Uh, and yet there is an image at the root of the piece that does take that story away from me. And, uh, and so ownership is something in that respect that I, that I do think we think about a lot. Uh, whose story is it? Whose story, who's allowed to tell which story? And, uh, and so I think we're kind of tapping into that uh, a little bit with that moment. And I would, I would also say in addition to that, there's um, a little bit of a sense of, uh, I guess, respect, um, like respect for what happens when something uh, happens that causes someone else pain in some way, and how do you react to that? Um, uh, why do we react the ways that we do? And um, we've recently been playing a little bit with the concept that um, in this piece, we're not actually separate people. Um, so also, what do you do when something that you enjoy causes you harm. Mm -hmm. so. oh. and, well, this yes. is kind of an extension of that, and you may have answered your question already, and it's totally unfair. But how do you take a piece of material which in, the, in itself is toxic, maudlin, and borderline unwatchable, and make it strange, nuanced, and evocative? <laughs> I think we're just going to say thank you. <laughs> 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 
Um, I, I would say when when I because I didn't I hadn't seen it. Um, I kind of imagined that I had seen it, but really all that I had was all of the things that society had kind of told me about the piece. Um, and once I watched it, I actually realized that this. This scene, which is actually the first scene where blackface takes place, um, is about 56, hour an hour six into a 90 minute film. So it is much, there's a lot more going on in the jazz singer than just that. So one of the things that I was really interested in was just kind of taking a moment and thinking about what does this piece say about American culture? What does it say about American culture that a uh, piece in, you know, that is really a story about a uh, young Jewish man, uh, maybe a first, uh, first generation American who is looking to create something uh, for himself and to live a life that he enjoys. Um, that inside of that story, um, there is also this like toxic blackface and the film is not actually about that or dealing with that at all. Um, and so what does that say about American culture in 1927 that that was like just a thing? Like, I mean, this was past the heyday of blackface as we discovered in a lot of our, our research. Um, so it was just like, um, for me it was interesting to see that and to find myself attracted to the story and also to be amazed that in 1927 there was such a Jewish story that was you know, at kind of out at the forefront of the talkies um, are the movies with synced dialogue. Yes, as we have taken to calling it. So um, I guess for me it was taking a closer look at the things that are good about it and not being afraid of the things that are toxic. Thank you. I think, what, uh, no, I'm sorry. We don't, uh, we, that, that is it for this afternoon. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Joshua Geld, Nehemiah Luckett, Mo Youssef. I want to thank uh, James Allister. I don't have my glasses on. I'm so sorry. Gazer. And I want to thank Mariana Valencia. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, for your work today and for sharing it with us. Thank you very much.